Passport Mommy with Michelle Gerson is a show about the journey of motherhood. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. Welcome to Passport Mommy. I'm Michelle Gerson, and this is a show about the journey of motherhood. And today, Marshall Stevenson, a good friend and dad to a toddler the same age as my daughter, is here to discuss the pressures of enrolling your young one in so many programs. Amanda Sukert is a certified lactation counselor. She'll talk about her company, The Booby Box, and have tips on nursing. Anastasia Sharova is also an entrepreneur and founder of the Happy Bellyfish, an online healthy cooking school. But first up, in addition to being a great mother, it's important not to lose sight of how to be great in your relationship. And for that, Dr. Steven Snyder, sex and relationship therapist and author of Love Worth Making, How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a Long-Lasting Relationship, is here. Hi, Dr. Snyder. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks so much, Michelle. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. So you have such a reputation as one of the most creative thinkers in the sex field today. You are an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. And you're a frequent guest on major media outlets such as um, and a contributor to Psychology Today and the Huffington Post. So I'm excited to talk to you. Your new book came out a few months ago. It's wonderful. It's practical. It's fun. It's empowering. So tell me what you find are some of the biggest obstacles so good sex and how we can get around them in a relationship. Okay. The biggest obstacle to good sex, you're going to think this is paradoxical, is orgasm. It's climax. Everybody's so obsessed with getting an orgasm that they forget to pay attention to the journey. So I always tell couples that uh, sex should be like a good meal. You should enjoy the appetizers and momentarily forget that they're just appetizers. Mm -hmm. And then when the entree comes, you should say, wow, well, we get to have an entree too. This is terrific. And then when you're almost full and the dessert tray arrives and you go, oh, I almost forgot we get dessert too. That's fantastic. That's what climax should be. It should be like dessert at the end of a good meal. But a lot of couples, they just figure, okay, we got a little bit of time. Let's both get dessert so we can go to bed. And that leads people to be chronically hungry. So in the process, people forget to think about whether they're really excited or not. They think if they're hard or wet, they're excited. Usually, just because you're hard or wet, you're not excited enough to really have good sex. You have to really get to the point where you've actually also lost some IQ points. Right. And, you know, and to go along with that, to get to that point, I feel you need to be really emotionally connected with your partner. So if you're not there emotionally and maybe you're not feeling it with them, that could affect what you're trying to achieve. Well, I'm really glad to be on this show because it's a show for parents, and uh, that is really the prime difficulty that parents encounter because, especially with young kids, you're getting touched all day long. Half the reason you want to have sex when you don't have kids is so you can be touched because most of us are starved for touch. After you have young kids, you're definitely not starved for touch. You're saturated (laughs) with touch. You don't want anybody to touch you at the end of the night. So right. the most important th- thing to do when you've lost a physical or emotional connection is don't panic. It's okay. You're not a machine. You're not supposed to feel connected all the time. It comes in waves. It comes and goes. It's all right. And if you don't panic, that's the first step. Uh, the second thing is you don't really need desire in order to have good sex. It's optional. And it's more important to have good sex than to have good desire. And once in a while, if you have good sex, that actually stimulates desire. It's kind of the reverse of what we used mm-hmm. to think, you know, like desire, you have desire, and then you have sex. In actuality, something often it runs in the reverse, especially for parents. You have good sex, and, and then if you do that a couple of times, maybe you'll start to have some desire. But desire is optional. Don't worry if you don't have it. <laughs> okay, so you mean you could not like your partner at a certain time and still have sex with them? I know that's not what you mean, but... Oh, totally. It's totally, you know, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, who likes their partner all the time? You know, these are the nightmare years. It's very stressful. You know, people people often really, really are at odds with each other. And, you know, they don't listen to each other and they feel, God, it's, it's so simpler if I wasn't married to this person, you know. Everybody feels that. Right. So how do you push past that, though, and still have the sex? Because I find it very challenging for both men and women to get absolutely. themselves to that point. Well, I have a technique uh, that I uh, kind of dubbed the two-step, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not a dance. Uh, it's, it's a sex technique, and it's an alternative to the date night because, you know, what you're supposed to do, according to most sources, is you're supposed to just put something on the calendar, get a babysitter, and go to bed and have sex. Unfortunately, right. that doesn't work because it's like making a reservation at a restaurant, and you get the time of your reservation, and you're not hungry. So what mm-hmm. do you do? 
Um, yes. So instead, you make an appointment on your calendar to go to bed and do absolutely nothing at all. Now, for most new parents, that's a very welcome thing. Yes. We're just going to hang out, and if you're lucky enough not to live in Manhattan, you can actually see the sky from your window. <laughs> it's kind of nice, and you can look at that, and you can just experience your breath, which most of us don't experience very much unless we're like mindfulness fans. This is a kind of a version of mindfulness. And you just mm-hmm. experience the weight of your body in the bed and the temperature of your toes and all those things, and you just kind of experience. You know, you go from thinking to just awareness. That state of awareness is where all the good stuff happens. So if you're in that state of awareness, then maybe you'll chat a little bit, but nothing heavy. Don't get any arguments or anything. Just uh, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And just enjoy that. And then after time, uh, perhaps one of you will notice something erotically interesting about the other's body and wants to pursue that just, you know, just in a relaxed and kind of leisurely way, just for its own sake. And that's just uh, appetizers. And then sooner or later, you're in the restaurant. I love it. That's great because I think couples do put too much pressure on themselves. And most men will say, I cannot schedule sex. They don't want to schedule sex, whether it's baby making sex or just sex to have sex. They say, "I, I can't do it. Exactly. And so uh, the, other, the other issue from a man's point of view, I, I represent this because I am a man. I, we're, we're my, my wife and I are actually empty nesters, which is this wonderful, wonderful thing. You can't wait to have kids and then you can't wait to get rid of them. Um, and uh, the most wonderful thing for a man being an empty nester is that the first time in 18 years you actually get your wife's complete attention. Because most women, after they have a child, they, they, that's where all their attention is. That's where all their libido is, really. Right. So, uh, so this is really nice. So the main thing, though, that a couple can do, if they want to keep that connection um, and they don't have a lot of time, is they shouldn't wait to when they're having sex to get excited together. They okay. should get excited together even when they're not having sex. They should get excited together even with their clothes are on when they're in the kitchen. So instead of kissing each other goodbye in the morning, you want to what we call in the sex therapy field simmer each other goodbye. Just a minute. You know, just like two teenagers uh, with a uh, break between class. They get three minutes. You know, just kind of hold each other and inhale each other's scent and kind of remind yourself why you're with this person in the first place because you kind of like the way they smell and just kind of just like groove on that again for its own sake and uh, hold them a little tighter, breathe together, maybe stare into each other's eyes, take a deep breath, and then go. Mm-hmm. And if all goes well, you experienced a little bit of arousal. You lost a couple of IQ points, and so you're right. not quite as coherent when you leave, and that's good. That's good. You want to do that every day. There's no reason you can't do that every day when you're kissing each other goodnight. You don't, don't kiss each other goodnight. You simmer each other goodnight. I love it. Now, what if you have somebody who is just not on board with that, that they're just not a goodbye person? I know someone that they say, it's just not me. I don't kiss goodnight. I don't say goodbye. I just leave. Right. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is really, really important. Passion is selfish. So you say to this person, I understand. I just want to enjoy your body for a minute, just selfishly for my own pleasure. Mm -hmm. They don't have to do anything. You may, if you're a woman, take the person's hand and just hold it or kiss it or bite it or whatever you want to do with it. And if you're a man, you may want to uh, put your arm around her waist and hold it and uh, perhaps run your hands through her hair if she hasn't already done her hair. Um, And uh, just selfishly for your own pleasure. Now, most people really like to be enjoyed. They like to be enjoyed without having to do anything. So you can right. do that. You can do that. That's what I would recommend. Say, okay, it doesn't have to be mutual. I just want to enjoy you. You can do whatever right. you want. And, and that's a good advice because then maybe they will pick up on that and say, oh, you know what, this is really nice. And then like you said, all of a sudden you're in the restaurant later. Exactly, exactly. You know, a couple sitting together watching TV and the wife says to the husband, how come you never grab me anymore? Something like that. Now, that's not such a turn on. Um, <laughs> however, if instead the wife says, hmm, you know what? Is it okay if I just kind of enjoy your body for my own pleasure? <laughs> Whoa, man, that's a what change What guy's going to say, nope, sorry, close exactly. for business. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, what do I have to do? No, nothing at all. Don't do anything. I just want to f- just enjoy your toes for my own pleasure. 
<laughs> I just want to hold them and kiss them, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, people like that. People like that. And people forget to do that. People forget to yeah. just enjoy each other. They just, like I said at the beginning, they're just so busy trying to make each other come that uh, they forget to enjoy each other. Right. I agree. A hundred percent. Great advice. All right. Well, I'm went. glad I'm glad that, uh, that that we're in agreement there. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's a key time. Well, because these, are, these really are the nightmare years, uh, you know, when your kids need yeah. to be picked up all the time and they're always having, you know, colds and you're up all night and stuff. This is just not so erotic. And so you really just need to cultivate those little things, those little one minute things where you can just remind yourself that, yes, you are a sexual being. Right. And they're great reminders. And I think all parents need to be reminded of that quite often. Dr. Snyder, where can people go to read, to get your book, to connect with you? Thank you so much. Um, On Amazon, you just dial in Love Worth Making, which is love making with the word worth stuck in the middle. Or you can go to my uh, book page, which is loveworthmaking.com. Perfect. Dr. Snyder, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope to talk to you again soon. And parents everywhere should get in touch and get your book because you know what? Even if they don't have time to make it into the office, simple read when you do have a few minutes of downtime could really help a relationship. Next up, we have Amanda Sukert. She is a certified lactation counselor. She launched The Booby Box. We'll talk to her coming up in a few on Passport Mommy. I'm Michelle Gerson. Motherhood is both amazing and difficult at the same time. The Passport Mommy, Michelle Gerson, is here to share in your journey. Welcome back to Passport Mommy. I'm Michelle Gerson, and I have with me Amanda Sukert. She became a certified lactation counselor and launched the Booby Box when her second daughter was diagnosed with colic and severe lip ties. Her goal is to help women like us feel supported through their postpartum breastfeeding journeys. And I love it. And I love talking to women who have invented products and services because of their own experience with parenting. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Michelle, for having me. Sure. So tell me a little bit about what made you start the Booby Box. Yeah, so my second daughter, uh, when she was about four months old, uh, started having uh, crying in the evenings every single night, and it was very stressful. And we found out that she had colic. Uh, and unfortunately, we couldn't formula feed her because the formula made it worse. Okay. And, and so there was a lot of pressure to um, sort of lean into breastfeeding and, and make that work for her sake. And how... Uh, And that's difficult. So this is at month three. Did you, had you already started nursing her? We had, yes. Um, I nursed my first daughter as well, um, but we only lasted about six weeks. Once we returned uh, to work, it was very difficult for me to continue nursing with the pumping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is really tough. I think for a lot of moms, they struggle with that because I know that with my daughter, I work part-time And even going back to work part time, having to keep up with pumping all day to have enough of a supply is very challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not a lot of moms respond well to pumps. Uh, Sometimes work schedules aren't conducive to pumping every two to three hours. Uh, And so it does. It can be very stressful. Yeah. I remember thinking, you know what? I felt like a a human cow for a while. (laughs) I was like, all I do is nurse and pump, nurse and pump, nurse and pump, nurse and pump. And I kept saying, okay, but this is great for my daughter. I just have to keep doing it. But it can be really challenging and it can cause a lot of women to just say, you know what? No big deal. Going to go with the formula. But you are trying to encourage women to nurse and to make it a little easier for them. So tell me how you're doing this through your lactation counseling and the booby box. Yeah. So one of the the biggest pieces uh, that make women successful with nursing is support, support and knowledge. Uh, Breastfeeding is actually a learned behavior. And most women don't have real life breastfeeding experience until they have their own child. Uh, And that makes support really, really important. Uh, With our boxes, we send products that give moms an opportunity to test out different lactation items. Lactation Mm -hmm. items can be very expensive. Uh, And so instead of having to buy a whole box of a certain bar or cookie or tea, uh, we give them the opportunity to test them out first. Uh, Additionally, we have products in there that can help them with things like returning to work, um, manual breast pumps or breastfeeding covers, uh, as well as things that aid their baby. 
uh, we've got teethers and teething necklaces and um, pump, uh, pump wipes and that sort of thing. Additionally, what we like to do is encourage our moms to join our private support group uh, mm-hmm. because, again, it, it all comes down to that support and having access to it 24-7. Um, most of us have not have those moments where we're worried we're not making enough, our baby isn't eating enough, uh, and so that support system is crucial to getting through that, asking those questions, and being able to get a professional, trustworthy answer. Yeah, absolutely. And what you said with the 24 seven support, because when you're up in the middle of the night, and I know my baby used to just fall asleep on me when I would try to feed her. And I thought I'm trying so hard, and you're just falling asleep. And, you know, it was like wet watch cloth to keep her awake and anything possible. And I think it is so nerve wracking. And people do worry about a low supply. And is there such a thing as a low supply in some women? There can be. Um, However, in most cases, when a mom comes to me and asks, um, what can I do to increase my supply? Uh, We back it up and say, what makes you think you have a low supply? Uh, Because babies cry for a lot more than just milk. Mm -hmm. Uh, they They want their mom's breast for heart regulation, breathing, temperature, comfort. Uh, So it's not always that your baby is hungry and that's why they're crying for you. Um, Also, some moms think they have a low supply because they're pumping. And let's say they're only pumping two to three ounces. uh, They start thinking, oh my gosh, that's not going to be enough to feed my baby while they're at daycare. What can I do to increase my supply? Uh, Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just troubleshooting that pumping experience versus there's nothing wrong with your supply. It's just not everybody responds the same way to breast pumps. Right. And I have found too, trying a few different pumps that some might be more powerful, some might be easier to use, which makes it easier to maybe keep on you for a longer period of time. So I do think moms need to experiment. And, you know, I don't know if it really helps with a few things that I did when I wanted to make more milk was I ate a lot of oatmeal. And I bet that oats are an ingredient in some of the bars that you supply in your kit. And you give foods and teas that may help with that. We do. We do. And, and some research suggests that that doesn't help. And then some suggest that it does. Uh, so we just want to make sure we know that women are using them and utilizing them uh, because they're so concerned about supply and how to increase it. And so we want to give them trusted brands and the opportunity to try those safely. Um, we do have a lot of moms now now that have uh, allergies or their babies have allergies as well. Uh, so we cater the, to that it's, right. it's really common um, to have a sensitivity to fenugreek or dairy or, or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's so much more information that we can find um, and people can find if they need to by talking with you, contacting you. And I'm excited because we are going to run a contest on the Passport Mommy Instagram page, on your Instagram page to give away one booby box to a lucky mom to help get them started on this breastfeeding journey. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited about it. And if there's any moms out there expecting moms or um, breastfeeding moms, please feel free to join our support group on Facebook as well. Uh, We are always available to answer any questions you have. We are Booby Box Mamas. That's our Facebook group. And then our Instagram and Facebook page, you can find us at the Booby Box. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Very informative. Next up, we have Anastasia Sharova from Happy Belly Fish. You're listening to Passport Mommy. Passport Mommy with Michelle Jerson is a show about the journey of motherhood. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Jerson, the Passport Mommy. Welcome back to Passport Mommy. I'm Michelle Jerson, and we talk about motherhood being a journey. And I know for me, when I found out I was pregnant, the first thing I said is, okay, I need to be really strict with my diet. But personally, I've always been into health and nutrition. And so I just said, you know what, I'm just going to step it up a little bit. And I'm going to make sure that my diet is mostly plant-based and I knew that you shouldn't have fish more than a few times per week. And I pretty much followed that throughout my pregnancy. And I found that I did not have insane cravings like a lot of people say they have. And it really, I feel, helped me 
maintain a healthy pregnancy weight gain and feel really good after I gave birth. And so when I came across Anastasia Sharova's site, the happybellyfish.com, I really wanted to have her on the show because she is an entrepreneur, a researcher, and a cook certified in Ayurvedic nutrition. And she's the founder of Happy Bellyfish, which is an online healthy cooking school. What I love is she is also a mother of a six-month-old, a business owner, and a yoga, yoga practitioner. So she knows the importance of easy, healthy eating solutions firsthand. Anastasia, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for having me on the show. You're welcome. So tell me, what made you start this business? Was it inspired by your six-month-old? I actually started a little bit before because um, I got onto this healthy eating journey because of my own feelings when I didn't feel good. And I started digging into, you know, different ways to make myself feeling better. It all happened still at my, uh, during my university years because, you know, um, I was um, doing this master's degree in research and you spend a lot of time sitting and doing a lot of unhealthy activities Right. So I was looking for ways to feel better. And this is when I started digging in the aspects of healthy living, when I started practicing yoga and I started learning about nutrition. Yeah. That, so. And I think that's really a good motivation. And you yourself personally lost a lot of weight practicing what you preach. Yes, that's true. I lost 15 kilograms. It didn't happen overnight because um, I also believe and I'm, a, you know, the living evidence for that, that if it's a healthy weight loss, it doesn't happen quick, but it stays with you forever. Right. And it happened when I changed my eating habits. So I'm a walking testament that it works. <laughs> Yes. And when you say you changed your eating habits now, for those who are not familiar with kilograms, because they're in the US um, and some people just know the conversion, it's 33 mm-hmm. pounds. And so 33 pounds can be a lot of weight. And especially if maybe you're not an extremely overweight person to begin with, that's a significant amount of weight to lose. And so how did you change your eating habits? So it's um, it was happening gradually because... Again, you know, if you want the new habits to stay, especially when it comes to food, then right. you have to take it easy. You know, you, you, you have to be kind to yourself mm-hmm. and not shock your body. And, you know, the first things that happened, I basically said no to sugar and I said no to processed food. So anything that comes in a package or pre-cooked or pre-made, even if it's just, you know, um, canned chickpeas, right. I removed it from my house completely and I removed it from my diet and slowly I started getting into the um, healthy cooking practices because you know if everything comes without the box then you have to do something with that Mm -hmm. and um, I should also say that I married a a hobby cook which also influenced my eating habits and the way that um, you know I could prepare these foods so slowly I became just uh, you know, um, as my eating habits changed, so one after another, the kilograms started disappearing. Yeah, and that's amazing. And I think it's great that you married somebody who loves to cook as well, because that really helps. Because I have to tell you, my husband is not a cook, and I like to eat very healthy. And I would love somebody <laughs> maybe also wanted to experiment. Although I do have to say that I think I've helped to make a difference in some of his eating habits. So that makes me happy and like slow steps. Maybe he'll start cooking down the line. Who knows? Yes. Changing the habits of your husband is a great achievement because it happened to me also, you know, if he was cooking, it doesn't mean that he was cooking necessarily healthy. And it was quite a huge undertaking for me to also help him to get off sugar cravings and our new way of eating actually helped to achieve it. Right, right, exactly. I really think that motivating each other is a huge help. So tell me a little bit about Happy Belly Fish. Mm -hmm. Happy Belly Fish is an online healthy cooking school. So we offer various programs, online programs and healthy cooking classes, as well as uh, meals, meal plans. And our goal is to make it very easy to implement healthy eating and healthy cooking in your kitchen. As you mentioned at the beginning of the show, you know, I have a very busy life and um, I also, I run a business and I have a baby, I have a family to take care of. And um, I also have 
a yoga practice daily in my life. So as many other women, I have no time. <laughs> yeah. How <laughs> do you find the time? How do you, do you have a babysitter or does she go to daycare? Um, I get help um, actually from my husband a lot. So I, I get help from the family when it's possible. So there is no wonder. It's not that I can do thousands of things at once. Right. It's not possible. <laughs> there are no super women, even, even if they say so, don't believe that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yes, and soon she'll be old enough to actually go to uh, to the kindergarten, mini kindergarten for the tiny babies. Oh, that's good. That's yes. good. Yeah, because I mean, I find it difficult. There's so many things I want to do with a business and it's just to find the time. And for people who say, oh, well, you can work from home, no problem. They, uh-huh. they just don't understand. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the ability to discipline yourself really helps a lot. And I had these habits before, before the baby came into the picture. Mm-hmm. So um, yes, I do wake up a little early. I do sleep later. I sacrifice my sleep at times. Yeah. When I can do otherwise, it's true. But yes, you, you can manage. Yes, I, I agree. So if somebody wanted to go on to Happy Bellyfish, what would they find? I know you have a bunch of different programs, not just for women who are pregnant, but for mm-hmm. all, all kinds of people who are looking to lose weight and eat healthier. Yes. Um, so all our programs are actually plant-based. Um, and it's not because we uh, promote a certain type of a diet, but you know there, are, there is quite a lot of controversial information and different approaches to nutrition of what's exactly the right way to eat or the healthy, the real healthy way to eat. Right. But there is a consensus that plants and everything that uh, concerning whole foods uh, should be the base of your diet. You know, whatever you put on the top of your uh, eating pyramid, the plants and the vegetables and the fruits should be at the bottom. So we learn uh, to cook them and to also to use creative ways to do it. And we also, uh, sorry, we teach to cook it, uh, to cook whole plant-based foods. And uh, we also get a lot of uh, inspiration from traditional cuisines from all over the world. It has okay. to do with the background of our instructors because we have them coming from Germany, Russia, India, and even South Africa. So they give uh, a lot of different fresh perspectives into what healthy and super real superfoods are. And the program range from creation of easy healthy desserts to a uh, traditional sour um, dough breaking, um, baking course, and even um, the mastery of using spices in your daily life for your health and for the flavor of your food. Sure. And I really like that because I'm a big fan of the plant-based diet for the same reason that you said, not necessarily because I have certain um, beliefs and viewpoints when it comes to animals, but just, I mean, I do, but also just because it is such a healthy way of eating. And there are so many studies that link dairy and meats and um, other sugar to different diseases. So why not eat clean, eat healthy and have more energy for you? And especially if you have a little one, you need as much energy as you can get. <laughs> and um, and I love your page. I was looking at the one about the desserts because they look so good and people don't realize how good whether it's a vegan dessert or just something that is low in sugar or you substitute certain ingredients can still taste. And it's very easy, you know, this is the best part because a lot of these desserts actually require just three, four ingredients. Yeah. And they look fantastic. They look professionally made. Right, right. I was excited because I live in a very small apartment. And so I don't have access to my oven even sometimes because it's blocked mm-hmm. with so many things. So the other day we actually moved stuff away and I got to make something simple. It was just an apple crisp, which I used oatmeal and apple pieces. And the recipe that I was looking at had called for sugar and this and that. And I said, you know what? Uh, uh-uh. I'm just going to use cinnamon, coconut oil. And I substituted a few things and it came out great. And I just think there is so much you could do with just a little bit of knowledge. And that's why I love your online courses because people don't need to go out and have tons of books in their uh, home anymore to try to find recipes. You could just get your program, which is very inexpensive, right? They're very reasonably priced. Excuse me, can you say again the last sentence? Oh, I... sure. So your programs are very reasonably priced as well for people who want to try different ones on your website, correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, because you can also purchase just a small part of the program. For example, if you're only interested, like you mentioned, uh, healthy desserts, you can also purchase a part of when you um, learn raw desserts or only baking, depending on what's your preference there. 
Right. And I feel like some p- people might start with one, try to learn that. <laughs> and then maybe when they're done with that, they think, oh, wow, this is really easy. I'm going to go on to the next one. And you've really helped expand people's learning tools for trying to prepare foods naturally and easily. Yeah, that's actually exactly what our students say. And um, they also mentioned the fact that, you know, the way that we approach the programs, we don't just give you a bunch of recipes. Sure, you can go and get a recipe book anytime on Amazon if you'd like to. But we teach to develop this kind of intuitive feeling for cooking, you know, to create the recipes of your own, to understand how you can easily substitute the ingredients. So that, for example, if you have a brownie craving, you can just go to the kitchen and do it without looking into any cheat sheets to how to make it. Just Mm -hmm. following your instincts. So give me an example. Can you give me a really quick example of a really easy and delicious recipe? Absolutely. I think some of the easiest recipes are the recipes of cookies and biscuits. And this is also what kids love so much and that you can also have as a wonderful snack on the go. So there is a range of cookies that you can make only with two or three ingredients. Uh, Probably one of the favorites is the peanut cookies, which you just make by making taking peanut butter which i also recommend to make yourself at home because it's okay. super easy <laughs> okay. and mixing uh, mixing it with oats flour and just adding a little bit of healthy sweetener like healthy sweeteners is a topic on on its own right but, uh, the, yes uh, not not a sugar substitute no but just a healthy sweetener let's say maple syrup sure do you use um do you like agave syrup do you find that that's a good one um agave syrup um is a bit of a um, uh, controversial topic, I would say, because um, there is quite a lot of research uh, confirming that there is not much difference between actually white sugar and agave. So this is the thing that I would personally avoid. That's interesting. And that's something that people can learn on your site, because I've always thought, I've always been taught, oh, it has a lower glycemic index, and it's better to use that than some other sweeteners. <laughs> You know, the rule of thumb, if you think about sweetener, is as much as with any other food. Um, there should be as little processing as possible. Right. So it also goes another very popular sweetener uh, that people love to use as stevia. Mm-hmm. But stevia is a grass. So when you sit in the shop, it usually comes in uh, white tablets or as a white powder. And you should always ask what happened to this grass so that it came to that consistency. Um, so if you look for really healthy sugar substitutes, you should look for those options which underwent the list of processing. Right. Um, right. Coconut sugar can be one of those examples. So maple syrup, as I mentioned already, or um, there is a certain type of uh, raw sugar, which is called jaggery or gur or panela um, in South America. It's a traditional product, but you can easily find it worldwide. So it's basically just the boiled, thickened sugar cane juice before any other processing starts. And I always, uh, we have a, a free sugar detox on our website, by the way, so everyone can join and just um, uh, find all this information there. Yes, well, thank you. This has been so informative. You've taught me a few things and I thought I was already well-educated in the health field. Anastasia, thank you so much for joining me today. I really learned a lot. People can go to your website, happybellyfish.com to learn more about you, your healthy, cook, your healthy cooking classes for real foodies, people who maybe are getting started or thought they knew a lot and they want to have healthy ideas for their kids and for themselves just for more energy and just better health. Next up, we have Marshall Stevenson. He is the owner of the New York Beer and Brewery Tour. He's a comic, good friend of mine, but overall just awesome dad. And we are going to talk about the pressures of enrolling your toddler in so many programs, at least the pressure we feel here in New York City. More coming up next on Passport Mommy. I'm Michelle Gerson. Motherhood is both amazing and difficult at the same time. The Passport Mommy, Michelle Gerson, is here to share in your journey. Welcome back to Passport Mommy. I'm Michelle Gerson, and I'm here with my good friend Marshall Stevenson. He is a comic, the owner of the New York Beer and Brewery Tour, and overall, just awesome dad. And we both have toddlers around the same age, so we get to see each other a lot at play dates and talk about all these issues that affect us as parents here in New York City and just in general. Hey, Marshall. Hey, I, yeah, I don't see any other of my friends except you because <laughs> we have these kid play dates. 
Exactly. It's a great excuse to socialize. I love seeing you. I mean, I love seeing your daughter too, but it's a great way to catch up. And, you know, I like these play dates and so many people choose to go another route and maybe they enroll their less than two-year-old in all these different, whether it's a daycare program or a separation program or a twos program. And I find myself feeling a lot of pressure as to, oh my gosh, if I'm not enrolling my daughter in all these programs, she's going to fall behind all these other kids. And I don't know, personally, I just think, I don't think I was in a twos program and I think I turned out okay. I'm just wondering how you feel about all this. Well, it is tough because you want to do, hi, sweetheart. We have a, I have a little sidekick here for the interview, <laughs> appropriately enough. I think there is, you know, a lot, of, I wouldn't call it pressure. I would call it, you know, I don't, I want to do the right thing. And right. so I'm not so sure what to do, but I'm not, I'm not buying into any of the pressure. So if that's the right word for it. Yeah, it is tough because you want to have your kid excel and not be at a disadvantage against the kids who are going to those programs. But at the same time, like, I really do believe, you know, that them being bored and just have time to explore on their own is really good for them. Like we're over programming very early. Yes, I agree with you. And I think that even just doing play dates, just as long as they're around other kids and they're getting exposure to other babies and they're playing and they're learning how to share and just different dynamics about being around other people, I think that's really beneficial at this age. And I do agree. You want to make sure that they are in line and they are prepared for when they go to nursery school or kindergarten. But uh, I'm with you. I'm not feeling the pressure that I think a lot of other people feel if that's what you call it right now you you were great yesterday because my little girl gets very shy at these play dates and it makes me wonder whether i was wrong not to not to put her in more because she seems completely overwhelmed and intimidated by all these other babies you know sweetheart you're scared of babies what you're good with you're scared of babies what's with that i don't understand (laughs) anyway so you she was clinging to me and you picked her up and with my permission, of course, right. pulled her aside and said, come on, we got to play with the other kids. And that was great because she actually responded to you better than me. But anyway, the point was that these play days, it's seeing her so shy, at least for the first half hour of them, makes me think maybe she should be in more. Maybe, maybe, maybe I didn't make the right decision. Maybe she should be more immersed. Right. And you know what? And I had a similar situation, not exactly that, but I was dropping my daughter off at the gym that I go to because they have a daycare. So for two hours, you can drop the children off and you can go work out. So for a while, she was really enjoying it and then would just start crying hysterically and could not bear for me to leave. And it broke my heart. And I thought, you know what? I should have her in a separation program. What am I doing? I can't just leave her here. She doesn't have the skills to know why I'm leaving. And it went on for a while. And the people at this gym just kept taking her and said, we're going to dis- we're going to put her on a slide. We're going to play with her. Don't worry, just go. And it was so hard for me, but now she's doing well. And I think these are just stages that they go through and they learn. And I, I don't think that we should feel, oh my gosh, it's because they're not enrolled in certain programs. It just happens. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, how do you, well, I don't know. We don't necessarily have the stomach for that. I mean, so you leave her in the program and she cries hysterically and you're just like, see you later. I'm sorry. You're crying hysterically. And you just get, I mean, I'm not saying that's not the wrong thing to do. That's hard. Like people who aren't parents don't realize like these are the kind of challenges. Oh my God, my heart is breaking and I'm walking away. Oh, believe me, the guilt of, oh, I'm just going to go work out while she's hysterically crying. No, I felt horrible. And I called down there several times to make sure she was okay. And when I would go to pick her up and I'd see her eyes were all swollen and she looked like she'd cried the entire time, I felt terrible. And then I didn't bring her back for a while. And then I said, okay, I'll try again. And I just, they kept telling me, look, it's just, this is what they go through. They go through separation anxiety. Don't worry, it'll pass. You just have to keep trying. So I kept trying and now she's doing better. So I think there are times that we just have to put the blinders on a little bit and say, okay, this is best for them. They're learning and, and just, just do it. 
Mark, just, learn how to, just learn how to, while your child is screaming bloody murder, like they're about to die, <laughs> just learn how to read a book and zone it out. That's the key. Exactly. Oh, we have to talk more about this. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but definitely because it is not easy. And if you're a parent, you know this journey is not easy. And that's why I thank you for joining me today on Passport Mommy. Don't forget, you can follow me on all the social channels, Passport Mommy. Have a great rest of the day and I'll talk to you next week.